Hello, JBS viewers. I'm David Harris, and this is Defending Israel. We have another very special guest today, Batya Unger Sargon. She is the opinion editor of Newsweek magazine, formerly the opinion editor of The Forward. She's an author, and you may have seen her most recently in her second appearance on Bill Maher's show. Batya, welcome. It's a real honor to be here with you. Thank you so much for having me. You know, I followed your career for so long, but actually, I realized we're meeting for the first time. Yeah, isn't that amazing? <laughs> <laughs> for me it is, and I'm grateful. Uh, we have a lot to cover, and time is not our friend. But for those viewers who may not know you, can you talk a little bit about your background? Because it's very, very relevant to what we're going to talk about next. Um, so I'm originally from Boston. I was raised in a very religious Orthodox family, which I am deeply, deeply grateful for. Um, and I went to high school in Israel. And then we moved back and I went to college in Chicago. Um, I got at my, the University, at of the Chicago. University of Chicago. I then went to Berkeley, got my PhD there, and then moved to New York and became a journalist. And parallel to, to that resume, your Jewish journey wasn't quite so linear, was it? <laughs> no. <laughs> my mom's not going to be thrilled if I admit this, but I did take a detour. Um, I was secular for many years, and then I sort of started inching my way back. For a while, I called myself conservadox, and now I'm from again, and uh, again, very grateful to Hashem for that. <laughs> so you, you, you have a from home? Yeah. Okay, so we have your resume, and we have the, your, your brief <laughs> and somewhat jagged Jewish journey. And now let's dive into your, what should we call it, political ideological journey, both as an American and as a Jew. Um, begin to walk us through that sort of political ideological journey of yours, because again, it's not linear, it's not straightforward, um, but I think it's very relevant for many Jews um, in America today. So I had the amazing opportunity of experiencing Israel as an American Jew and then American Jewry again as someone who had lived in Israel. And so it gave me this real perspective on both communities where I'd felt a part of both communities but also a sense of alienation as well. Um, when I moved back to America, um, I had this feeling of sort of overwhelming homecoming because I do feel in my core um, that I am a Jew, but I am an American Jew, and I feel unbelievably cr proud to, to be an American and very, very uh, uh, tightly knit into the fabric of American society. Um, I think as Jews, we have um, such an obligation to feel hakaras hatov, um, a sense of um, gratitude and obligation to this country that has been so good to our people, um, as opposed to literally every other place on planet Earth. Um, and so I, 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 I identify very strongly as an American and very strongly as a Jew. Um, I also, you know, I consider myself a woman of the left, although I don't consider today's left to be really of the left. Um, I did for a while, for a while I identified strongly with the American left, um, but it became very... Because? Why? Um, I mean, <laughs> that's a really good question. I, I, I think it probably has to do with um, feeling like the values that are important to me were things that were espoused on the left historically. So standing with labor, Dr. King's vision, right? That we treat everybody equally. Although of course Dr. King thought that his vision came from the Bible and he was of course right. right. You know, this idea of equality before the law. The Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew clear. Bible, yes, the Torah, which we introduced into Western civilization. Another thing that Jews should be unbelievably proud of, but you never really hear liberal Jews talking about that for some reason. Um, and so I, I, I felt that that was sort of where I belonged. But in 2019, it became very clear to me that the price of being a member in good standing on the left in America and the global left as well was you had to denounce your Jewishness. You had to denounce your people. You had to denounce Israel in order to belong. And I thought that was lame. I mean, to denounce your own people, I thought that was disgusting. And so I, um, but that to me was they abandoned right, the values right, right. of the left. <laughs> right, you stood your ground and- Exactly. <laughs> okay, so 2019, 
from, from what I gather was quite an important year for you along this journey. Um, I know of at least two things that happened. One involved Ilhan Omar, and one involved an experience you had at Bard College in upstate New York. Can you talk to JBS viewers a little bit about both and how they affected this this journey of yours. Yes, absolutely. So um, it, uh, at some point in 2019, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar tweeted out, it's all about the Benjamins as a reference right. to why American foreign policy was uh, going in a certain direction. And um, I, I thought that was pretty anti-Semitic to suggest that you know uh, Jewish money was somehow at the root cause of why America is so pro-Israel as opposed to, oh, the fact that 80% of Americans are Zionists and want American foreign policy to reflect a strong commitment to our greatest ally in the Middle East. And fellow democracy. Exactly. Um, and so I sort of tweeted like, you know, something, you know, suggesting that this was anti-Semitic and the, the absolute vitriol that I got and the, the justification was because she is a woman of color, therefore she cannot be criticized. She's exempt. Exactly. Um, it really started to influence how I understood the left's relationship, not just to Jews, but to race more generally. Um, in 2018, I had come across a study that um, was so disturbing to my worldview that I remember putting it in a drawer and saying, I am not ready to deal with what this means. And in 2019, that no longer became available to me. And let me tell you a little bit about this study. Um, the study was a 2018 Yale study. And it found that there is a difference between how white liberals and white conservatives talk to blacks and Hispanics. And here is the difference between how white liberals and white conservatives talk to people of color. White liberals dumb down their vocabulary when they encounter a person who has darker skin than them. And I thought to myself, and we call them, the white conservatives who don't do this, the racists? I mean, it was an obvious uh, indictment of the entire worldview that has gripped the left, this wokeness. Um, and, and, and I started to see that everywhere, that sort of patronizing idea that a person of color has no agency, no responsibility to act morally. And I think this is what you're seeing with the left's attitude toward Hamas, to bring this back to something relevant to today. You know, this mystery, how could it be that the women's movement the same people who decided six years ago that flirting at the office is the civil rights issue of our time are siding with the Hamas rapists over the Jewish women who they raped. And the answer is because to them, a person of color has no agency and thus no responsibility to behave morally. All of the agency belongs to the white person or the Jewish person, including if they are the victim of rape. Um, Bacha, I think someone called it the racism of low expectations, yeah. which is, I think, what, what you're describing. So we're still back in 2019. Uh, have you connected all the dots between Ilhan Omar and yourself? Or is there more to the story? Well, I when when all, I got all of this backlash, and I thought I, I started to understand because people were telling me the only way to be a member in good standing on the left would be to say, "Oh, I'm going to accept anti-Semitism from people of color because they cannot be held to the same mm -hmm. standard." Did you and she ever have a face-to-face -face exchange? No, like this? I, I did try to reach out. Um, we tried to, you know, get her to, to write something. I mean, she did apologize for those comments, which was so funny because she apologized, but all of the left was still defending her as having said nothing wrong. Um, and and oh, you asked me about the Bard College. Right, that was the second moment yes. in 2019. Um, I mean, I think by then I had pretty much, I was not so surprised by what happened, but basically I was on a panel. At Tell a, viewers what happened, because I'm not sure everyone either knows or remembers. I was invited to speak about anti-Semitism um, at, a, at a conference on racism and anti-Semitism. And there was only one panel that was all Jews talking about anti-Semitism, and I was on it. And that it. included, I think, Ruth Weiss. From, Ruth Weiss from was Harvard on University. it, and Shani Moore, who is a right. brilliant, brilliant uh, I see, Israeli. I see him on social media. Yes, he's one of those people who I hate because he's smarter than me, and he <laughs> always gets there before me, and no, then he, I wish I had said what he said. <laughs> 
no, it, it's true. Everyone it, should it, follow no him. No hyperbole here. He, he, he is quite brilliant. So it was the three of you on it a panel. It was the three of us. And this, you know, these anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian protesters showed up. And I, I remember standing on the panel and literally saying to them, like, do you not understand that what you're doing is racist? Like, we're here to talk about anti-Semitism and you want us to answer for Israel? Um, and it was just like, it was so shocking. Um, uh, you know, it was, it's very like, you know, the norm now. I'm very glad that I had that experience. But again, it was the backlash to that experience that was, you know, people saying they did nothing wrong, people saying it didn't happen, the right. gaslighting around it. And I will tell you something interesting. So in 2019, I thought that was racist to come to a Jew who wants to talk about anti-Semitism and say, answer for Israel. I don't think that's racist anymore. You want me to answer for Israel, I will answer for Israel now. And that changed since October 7th. And I, rem I realized it had changed a couple weeks after October 7th. I was in an airport and, you know, I wear this Jewish star. And, um, you know, this, there was a group of people um, waiting to check into a flight to Egypt. And um, as I walked past the line, one of the women in line, which she was standing with like a big group of men, she shouted after me, Palestine will be free. And I remember sort of chuckling to myself and thinking, not if Egypt has anything to say about it, right? <laughs> um, but by the time right. I got to my gate, I thought to myself, you know, there was a time where I would have thought, oh, that's anti-Semitism to hold one Jew responsible for the rest. And, you know, I don't think it is anymore. If it is, I don't mind it. Hold me responsible. I'm standing with those Jews. You know, put me with the bad Jews. Whatever Jews you want to attack, put me with them. I will answer for them because things just changed on October 7th. The calculation changed. Talk more about how it changed for you. I mean, that's, that's a, a great illustration. You're willing now to say Israel is, is something I'm ready to defend. What else changed for you after October 7th? So a lot of things didn't change. I have, um, I have a few, I had three very close friends who are Palestinian before October 7th. I now have two and I'm very grateful to them. We totally agree, disagree on the issues and they keep me honest because I know that I cannot, I cannot mm, uh, stereotype the other side because I know that they are on the other side mm -hmm. and I know they love me and they would not advocate anything that they believe would harm me. So that, it forces me to be extremely honest in my critique. I cannot simply say a caricature of the other side, although many people on the other side are of course a caricature, you know, people like AOC or what have you, who really don't care about whether Jews are safe or not. But I know that there are also people on the other side who I respect and I'm so grateful that they are still in community with me. Um, and so from a political position, you know, in terms of, you know, Israel and, and where I position myself, I don't know that so much has changed. Um, I think that, um, I, I think the most important question for me has become the question of sovereignty. Um, what does Israeli sovereignty look like? And so I'm thinking about it, I think, as an American, you know, in terms of our foreign policy as Americans. How do we respect Israel's sovereignty? How do we respect our when sovereignty? When you say sovereignty, in this case, you mean Israel's decision making, Israel's independence? Can you be specific? What does it mean? When I take myself out of it as a Jew who will do anything to ensure the safety of other Jews and you know that the Jewish state is, is safe, um, there is a an objective calculation to be made, the kind of thing I can defend to, to Palestinian friends, of you know, what does sovereignty mean? What does a nation state mean? What does independence mean? Um, what does the, the ability of a people to live in peace and determine their future, self-determination mean, right? The root of all civil rights comes from sovereignty and the nation state and nationalism. Um, and I think those are incredibly important questions to be asking. Um, by the way, there's a level of American support that could interfere with Israeli sovereignty as well. Um, I think, you know, for me, one of the biggest differences between Joe Biden and Donald Trump when it comes to foreign policy is that Joe Biden likes his allies to be weak and dependent because then they're easy to control. And Donald Trump likes allies who are strong and powerful because he thinks that, lame, that, he thinks that weakness is lame and he does not like to be 
photograph next to people he considers to be lame. And he wants strong allies who can bring something to the table for America, whereas Joe Biden wants the opposite. Like most Democrats, he wants allies that depend on him so he can control them. And But you don't think that Donald Trump, at the same time as he likes these strong men, also wants people who are deferential at the end of the day? I mean, it, it, uh, you're drawing two very different personality types. I, I get it. But does Donald Trump really respect people who are as strong as he is or are willing to push back? Um, I think he respects sovereignty. I think he respects Israel's sovereignty. Okay, yeah, th that I get. So Interpersonally? You mean like uh, at a purely... This is well, not a defense of his personality. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really asking geopolitically. I mean, you know... W w would he have appreciated an Angela Merkel that stood up to him as, as German chancellor and asserted the German sovereign right to build Nord Stream or to uh, engage in soft power exercises with Putin, fruitless exercises? Well, I think his you know, um, relationship with Putin is very much predicated on respecting someone who is doing what they think is right for their mm -hmm. nation state and for their people. E uh, even if it's wrong. Even if it's <laughs> for wrong, many of us. yeah. Um, so, in saying this, obviously you have something more somewhere in your mind about the nature of the relationship between the United States and Israel and what it should be and where it should be going, whether it's under Joe Biden or another president. What are your bigger thoughts on that subject? I don't like to see Israel having to take Dearborn, Michigan into consideration when deciding whether or not it's gonna go save its hostages. That offends me, and... Let, let's be clear, I, for those viewers who may not know the reference to Dearborn, you mentioned Dearborn because? So uh, Dearborn, um, Michigan, has the highest per capita rate of Muslim Americans, and they have been um, struggling to make Gaza an issue for Joe Biden in the 2024 presidential mm -hmm. election by voting uncommitted. And while I don't personally think that is going to get anywhere in terms of how the calculation between Trump and Joe Biden falls out, I think 600,000 auto workers in Michigan are gonna be much more important than 100,000 Muslim Americans. And you said this on Bill Maher. I said this on Bill Maher. Um, at the same time, um, Joe Biden has been putting a red line on the Rafa offensive that the Israelis want to pursue when they finish in Khan Yunis, uh, because he needs to appeal to those voters, or at least make them think that he cares about this the way that they do from their point of view. And I don't like the idea that Israel should have to pay any attention to that. And okay. a dependency okay. based on military aid could potentially end up being the reason that they have to pay attention to that, and I don't like that. Okay, now I think now it's clear to viewers. Um, so in our remaining time, I, I wanna talk about two subjects, if I may. Um, number one, how, have, how would you assess the, the Jewish response to October 7th and its aftermath? In your view, are Jewish organizations, mainstream Jewish organizations, are they doing what you think they ought to be doing? Should they be doing something else? Are they helpful? Are they irrelevant? What's your assessment? So first of all, as uh, a Jewish person in America, um, one side very much has our back, and unfortunately, some Jewish organizations have spent a lot of energy demonizing that side. Let me guess, the one side is the Republican <laughs> Party? I would say it's the American working class. The American working class, that's, okay, that's a new take, I think, for many viewers. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have a book coming out in April, April 2nd, it's called Second Class, uh, How the Elites Betrayed America's Working Men and Women. I spent the year traveling the country interviewing working class people mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, the divide on Israel, you know, people say there's a divide within the Republican Party on Israel. Israel has become a wedge issue. No. There is a class divide in America that separates out the college credentialed elites from the working class. And all of the problems <laughs> stem from that white college educated elite, which unfortunately many Jews belong to. 
But this is also a reversal, isn't it? Um, the Democratic Party, once upon a time, not so long ago, was the party of labor unions, of the, of the Detroit auto workers. Republicans were seen as the country club, yeah. elites, uh, well-educated. Have we flipped? Yeah, that's exactly right. There's been a complete realignment. Really? Nine of the 10 richest counties in America now vote for Democrats. 97% of the donations that come out of the media and out of Silicon Valley go to Democrats. 65% of Americans who make more than $500,000 a year now are Democrats. And meanwhile, the majority of people living in districts that make below the median income, they are represented by Republicans. So there's been a total um, reversal of who the parties represent. But Bacha, to bring us back to the original question, what you're saying is that Jewish organizations have not necessarily been able to make this shift, to, 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 to engage with... It's so much worse than that. They okay. sided with the people who hate us over the hard-working, good-hearted Americans who are protecting us and protecting Israel. <laughs> it's horrible. It's horrible. They made the wrong bet. They bet on this intersectional garbage and sold out our people and sold out the front lines in America, which is Christians who... who Do we need new advocacy organizations uh, if, uh, representing the Jewish community? Uh, or can these be sort of reimagined, retooled? Are there others out there that maybe I'm not seeing who reflect your point of view? People who go to university here, especially elite universities, where a lot of Jews end up, Including yourself, Including by the way. Including myself. <laughs> Some would say universities of Chicago and Berkeley aren't too, aren't too shabby. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about from the inside, okay? <laughs> okay. Well, there are lots of folks who harbor illusions about you know, those marquee names. No, no. I am totally implicated in the class <laughs> critique that I am leveling. Um, the number one thing you learn at these universities is to have contempt for people who don't have a degree and to hate America. I mean, it's just built into the curriculum. Yeah, a lot of people do STEM. A lot of people you know, go into sciences. A lot of people don't go into the humanities. But every person who gets a college degree has to take a Composition 101 class that's taught by an English PhD who, in order to get her PhD, had to take a critical theory class in which they teach all of this crap. And they hate, they're taught to hate America and unfortunately the whole DEI system is baked into that worldview of powerful versus powerless, people of color have no agency, America is inherently flawed, this great nation is inherently flawed. No Jew should allow the slander that America is still a racist white supremacy to stand after what this country has done for us. Not one of us should allow that to, to stand. And yet, instead of opposing that slander, many Jewish organizations, because they are staffed by college grads and catering to college grads, they put out this nonsense. And their response to October 7th has been, how could you not include us in the oppression hierarchy? We too are oppressed. Don't give us the white treatment. Don't treat us like those white people who, by the way, are the ones out there defending us. We want to be treated like the marginalized people that we are. I think that's disgusting. Well, I wish we had more time because that's it. You've opened a huge, huge issue. And, um, but we have only a few minutes left, mm -hmm. and, and we need to talk about one other issue at least. Um, many describe the threat of anti-Semitism today with the adjective surging, surging anti-Semitism. Number one, how do you assess anti-Semitism today in America? And number two, however you assess it, um, what do you think should be the response? Um, so there are some anti-Semitic things that are surging. Um, there are people is anti-Zionism? So there are people chanting Hamas's slogan, right, from right. the river to the sea. Now, again, my Palestinian friends will say, we, we just mean a democracy for all its citizens. That's fine. It is in Hamas's charter, though. If you accept that so, at face value. <laughs> yes, but it, so I think the burden is on the people right. chanting the Hamas was, slogan exactly. to prove that they and don't not, mean and, it that way. And not way. for us to simply we do not accept have to accept facial. that, exactly. So that chanting is on the rise. Graffiti is on the rise. Um, people saying anti-Semitic things is on the rise. This is all in the level in, in the level of protected speech. 
this great nation that I'm sitting here making this fulsome defense of was literally founded on the idea that people can chant for a genocide against you. That is protected speech. And we do not win this war, which is a war of good versus evil, by turning our backs on the very values that this great nation was founded on. And I say this as a person who's coming from the from community. In our community in 2019 and 2020, there were literally physical attacks on from Jews every single day in Brooklyn hundreds and hundreds of physical attacks. Right. And where were all these organizations then? You didn't hear liberal Jews standing up. For, for years it went on and no one had a word to say about it. That was anti-Semitism surging. This, it's very clear to me that despite the calls, there has been not a lot of incitement. It has not risen to the level of incitement because the physical attacks are not dramatically on the rise. There have been a handful. And the reason for that is because America is a great country in which even the people who support the Palestinians are nice middle class people who live next door to nice middle class Hasidim in Brooklyn and they just want to get along. This is not Europe. But, but, but Bacha, when, when, when high school students and college students say maybe we're not being physically threatened, we're being bullied, we're being intimidated, we're being socially marginalized, do you take that into account? They are being bullied, they are being socially marginalized, they are being intimidated. And to that I say, you need to grow a spine because it's not supposed to be easy to be a Jew. Okay, so this brings me to the end. So what do we do? How, uh, you, you have your interpretation. What do we as a Jewish community do? What is our response? I mean, we, 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 we earlier thought that embracing liberal democratic values in a post-war America would solve the problem. We focused on Holocaust education. We focused on the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism. I can go down the list. We focused on inter-ethnic diplomacy. All of those have not proved to be sufficient. What's the strategy? Do you know who's not struggling with this problem? The from community. Right. Because when you have, when you have your hands wrapped around this tradition mm -hmm. and you know that you were put on this planet to live and die as a Jew, you don't have to ask how do we fight this moment because you know. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear that. I'm not saying everybody has to show up in shul tomorrow, but you know, th that is how we survived for 2,000 years. We have the most amazing books and amazing tradition. Put on tefillin, go to shul. I, I can't even tell you how much of a bulwark against everything we're worried about this is. And you know what? Even in a post-October 7th world, you think I'm not struggling with my faith after what, what happened, what was allowed to happen? My God, when they shot those three hostages and they were almost saved, I, th that's the point is you struggle with it. Because when you're struggling with this tradition, nothing else matters and nothing can touch you. Wow. Bacha, I wish we had another 30 minutes, um, but from the beginning I knew time was, <laughs> was not going to be our friend. Uh, you are a very original, independent, Thank creative, um, uh, fearless, a defender of the Jewish people, and I want to thank you. JBS viewers, I promised you a very <laughs> thought-provoking um, 30 minutes. Uh, you got it in spades from Bacha Unger Sargon. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, and viewers looking forward to our next session together. This is David Harris, Defending Israel.